Finally, my dear Harold, finally. In a few seconds, you will learn why this mansion is so completely burglar-proof. I saw the men working on the wall, Mr. Simmons. They were finished with the masonry two days ago. Oh, yes, they were finished with the masonry. A wall ten feet high now completely covers the front of this place of mine, and there is nothing but a cliff in back. But a mere wall and a cliff are not sufficient protection. I'm afraid I don't understand. You will, my dear Harold, you will. You are my caretaker, but your work will be relatively easy. Believe me, it will be easy. Oh, what's keeping those men? Keeping them from what, sir? From trying out the device they've installed. I can't imagine... Ah, hear that, Harold? Harold, you hear that? What is it, Mr. Simmons? It's an electric eye system, Harold. It's completely foolproof and burglar-proof. If anyone so much as approaches within six feet of any part of those walls, that alarm goes off. Nobody can get to me here, Harold. Ha! Nobody. Mr. Simmons... You've never told me who it is you were afraid of. Who it is? It could be any of a dozen people, Harold. Weak people. People who resented the fact that in the battle of business, I was successful, and they weren't. But now I'm safe, with you to look after me 24 hours a day. You can depend on me, Mr. Simmons. Indeed I do, Harold, and indeed I will. It's true I know nothing of your background, but you strike me as satisfactory. You look me square in the eye all the time. That's important. Besides, I'm used to taking chances on people. Five years ago, when I first hired Betty Jarnes as my secretary, I knew nothing of her either. Miss Jarnes is very capable. Yes, and very lovely. And I've rewarded her, Harold, just as I'll reward you if you are faithful to your duties. When I die, she receives a considerable fortune. I'll do my best, Mr. Simmons. Oh, Harold, just to prove to you that I'm not an old fool, I said I knew nothing about you. That is true. But just in case you were sent here by one of my friends... Mr. Simmons, Please don't I... think I overlooked that possibility. Just in case you were sent here by one of my friends, allow me to assure you that I have means of protecting myself at all times. See? That gun is entirely unnecessary where I'm concerned, sir. Perhaps. But it is well to have it with me all the time, regardless. I'm glad we had this little chat, Harold. As you can see... I'm protected from strangers by the wall and its electric eye. And I'm protected from my own household by this gun. I'm completely safe. And for the first time in years, I'm at ease. Very good, sir. I'm glad. I'm an old man, Harold. And this is the freedom I've been looking forward to for years. Perhaps I don't have too long to live. But they're going to be easy years. Harold, didn't you hear what I said? Yes, sir. You said perhaps you don't have too long to live. Jim. Jim, are you there? Hello, sis. I'm here. Why are you calling me? I had to talk to you, Jim. So much is happening, and you're a thousand miles away. Another gripe about that job of yours? Yes, it's still Mr. Simmons. He's unbearable. So why don't you quit? Why do you keep calling me up and complaining every week? Oh, no. No, I don't quit this job. Not with all that money I'm being left in Simmons' will. I'm sticking. Well, then, what's your beef? He's moved out to a place in the country. There's a wall around the house. The windows are barred. And I've got to work there and live there. What do you want me to do? I don't know. All I know is that this place is a prison. Gray stone, flat roof. Oof. Those barred windows and the wall, I feel like I'm in jail. Oh, if only something would happen to the old buzzard. Like what? Like realizing that you deserve a couple of days off a week so you can have a fling at living? That's not what I'm thinking, Jim. I was thinking that it looks like I'm going to be able to live only if Mr. Simmons dies. Take 
Take a letter, Miss Jonas. Yes, sir. To Frank Rodney, Bank Building City. Dear Frank, in reply to your letter of even date, the answer is no. Sincerely. Sign my name to it. Yes, Mr. Simmons. Now then, take a letter. Mr. Th- Simmons, uh, could I please fix myself some lunch now? I can take the rest of the letters this afternoon. Of course not. My mail comes first. But it's three o'clock, sir, and I haven't had anything to eat since breakfast. Dissatisfied here, Miss Jonas? If you are, I might be able to make other arrangements for a secretary. Of course, there are other changes that would be made at the same time. Changes affecting my will. Mr. Simmons, will you please forget about that will? That's all I ever hear from you. After all, I just wanted a sandwich. Is that so unreasonable? It is, inasmuch as I have other things for you to do. You know, Miss Jonas, perhaps you've been with me too long. Take a letter to my attorney. Ask him to please be here tomorrow morning and to bring my will with him. Vance? Oh, Vance? Oh, just a minute. Uh, Markham, what are you doing here at this hour? Come in. Thank you, Vance. I'm sorry to have awakened you. Awakened me, my friend. No, you didn't. I haven't been to bed. I've been reading up on criminal identification through hair analysis. Very interesting. Kept me from realizing it was daylight. (laughs) Vance, don't you ever do anything that ordinary people do? Like sleep, you mean, Markham? (laughs) I'd have gone to sleep if I were tired. I wasn't, so I stayed up. How about you? District attorney's hours don't begin this early, do they? They do when there's a murder. And there's been a murder, Vance. In that case, Markham, I'll slip out of this robe and into a shower and be with you in a moment. Come along, you can tell me all about it. Right. It seems, Vance, that a millionaire named Ezra Simmons built himself a mansion out in the suburbs and installed every known method of burglar alarm. But someone got in last night and shot him to death. Really? I know about Simmons. He made a fortune stepping on people's backs. I'll hop in the shower and make this as quick as possible. Good. Of course, Vance, there's a possibility that Simmons was killed by someone in his house. His secretary, Betty Jarnas, or his caretaker, Harold Eckner. No question about that possibility. Miss Jarnas claimed she couldn't stay in the house last night and went into town, returning this morning to discover the body. And the caretaker claims he heard no one try to get in. Nor will he say he killed Simmons. Unreasonable of him, isn't it? How would you like me to tell you how Simmons might have been killed? But, man, how could you? Apparently, neither the caretaker nor Miss Jarnas killed him. That's a little too obvious. And you don't know any... And you don't know anything about any of the details of this case. All I know is what you've told me, Markham. But I won't disturb you with one of my long-range predictions. I'd suggest we get right up to the Simmons mansion. Right now, Vance? Hardly. I think we ought to wait until I get dressed first. That's it, Vance. That's the Simmons house just on top of that hill. I see it, Markham. Large, isn't it? Quite. And that wall surrounding it must be ten foot high with barbed wire at the top. Probably electrically charged wire. Mr. Simmons was well protected. Apparently not well enough protected, Vance. Somebody did get to him, remember? Yes, I most certainly do. And somebody most certainly did. Now, I guess I'd better stop here and wait for someone to... Now, what in the world is that? An electric eye system, I imagine. As soon as any object comes between the posts in front of the gate, those bells go off. Of course. Here comes someone to open the gate. Caretaker, probably. Probably. I asked Sergeant Heath to let him resume his duties around the place until we got here. Hello there. Hello. You're Mr. Markham? Yes, and this is Philo Vance. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Where is Sergeant Heath? He's up at the house. They've taken Mr. Simmons' body away, but Sergeant Heath said for me to expect you. Very kind of the sergeant. That's quite an elaborate bell system Mr. Simmons had installed, isn't it? Yes, it is. It wasn't necessary where you and Mr. Markham were concerned, though. I saw you two from my room, and when I saw your car, I came down to open the gate. Well, hop on the running board, Eckner, and we'll drive you to the house. Yes, sir. Just follow the road. It turns left a little way up. Right. Just a minute, Markham, if you please. What is it, Vance? Stop the car. Certainly. I want to look at the outside of this place. Eckner, can you drive the car up to the house? Yes, Mr. Vance. Do that, will you, please? Come on out, Markham. I'm with you, Vance. There. I'll leave the car in front of the house, Mr. Markham. Thank you. Now, Vance, what is this for? 
You know that Heath is holding Mr. Simmons' secretary, Betty Jarnas, up at the house. Why stop? I just thought of a way that somebody could get past that wall without sounding the alarm. But how, man? By tunneling under it? No, nothing quite that obvious. If there had been a tunnel, Heath would have discovered it by now. I thought if there were a lawn... But there isn't. There's nothing but rocks leading from the wall to the house. What were you thinking? Well, if the murderer were very clever, he could have gotten past that wall without sounding the alarm by using my method. And that method was? By vaulting over the wall, using a pole. Of course, the murderer would have had to be an athlete, but that would have narrowed down our suspects. Yes. But nobody or nothing could land on these rocks. Well, I see our friend the caretaker's waiting for us at the door. Yes, he is. Oh, Eckner, where is Sergeant Heath? He's trying all the windows for clues, Mr. Markham. Will you come in, sir? Uh, yes, we will. Thank you. Is this the library, Eckner? The living room, Mr. Vance. Uh, Miss Jarnis is in there waiting for you. Good. Come in with us, will you please? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Mr. Markham and Philo Vance, uh, Miss Jarnis. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? Hello, Miss Jarnis. I hope we haven't kept you waiting. You have. But does that matter any to you? Frankly, no. Now that your attitude is apparent... Miss Jarnis, who might have killed your employer? Almost anybody he formerly did business with. He was cordially hated by a lot of people. Including you. I hated him as much as anybody, I guess. But you continued to work for him. Oh, yes. Yes, I was a very faithful employee. Mm. Wouldn't you be if you were being left a lot of money by an old man? How much money, Miss Jarnis? I'd like to go up to my room, Mr. Vance, please. I have a headache. Of course. Thank you. By the way, Miss Jarnis, how much money was Mr. Simmons leaving you? How much? Yes. A million dollars. You can say that again, Markham. Oh, Eckner. Yes, Mr. Vance? Were you in Mr. Simmons' will, too? I've only been here a week. I see. Markham, uh, walk over to the window with me, will you please? Of course, Vance. What's on your mind? Tell you in a moment. Keep your back to our friend, Mr. Eckner, there, and listen to this. Mr. Eckner? Mr. Eckner! He doesn't answer, Vance. I'd better turn around and see if he's still there. Yes, he is. I just wanted confirmation of a theory, Markham. This one is correct, thank goodness. You see, the late Mr. Simmons went into an involved routine to have his home wired with gongs that would go off if an intruder approached. But all in vain. I still don't know what you're driving at, Vance. Don't you? Well, Eckner here, the man he depended upon to protect him in case those gongs went off, happens to be stone deaf. This is District Attorney Markham. The million-dollar murder case opened with the finding of the body of Ezra Simmons, much disliked recluse, despite all of Simmons' efforts to protect himself. Suspects include his secretary, Betty Jonas, and a caretaker, Harold Eckner, who, Vance has discovered, is stone deaf. At noon of the day following the murder, Joseph Hargrave, Simmons' lawyer, arrived at the mansion. All of us, Vance, Miss Jarnas, Eckner, and I, are gathered in the library to hear him read the will in his book. Uh, very well now, very well. Uh, quiet, please. I must have quiet, please. You'll have it, Mr. Hargrave. Good. Now, let me see, where do I begin? Oh, yes. Uh, Miss Jarnis, you wrote me a letter asking me to be here today. Yes, I did. And to bring the will, Mr. Simmons wanted you here with it. I uh, don't know why. I don't care why. Guarantee he didn't know he'd be dead when I came now. Did he? Or did he? Uh, could he have committed suicide? Hardly, Mr. Hargrave, hardly. I uh, didn't think he would. It wasn't the type. Mr. Hargrave, if you don't mind, I'm quite anxious to find out what was in the will. Uh, what are you so anxious about, Mr. Vance? Nothing in it for you. Uh, Miss Jarnis here gets a million dollars. Mr. Eckner gets 10,000. The rest goes to a home uh, for cats. 
And he left me $10,000, but I've only been with him a week. There was a copy of the will on Mr. Simmons' desk. You were here long enough to see it, you know. Uh, Miss Jarnis, you can't mean I killed Mr. Simmons. Oh, can't I, well, though? what about you and, and the million dollars you got? You could have killed him. I wasn't in this house when he was killed. You know that. I called to you and told you I was going out. Please, both of you, if you don't mind, I'd like to do some talking. And if you don't mind, I won't listen. I can't stand people talking. Makes me nervous. If you don't mind, I'll just go to the kitchen and make myself some coffee. (laughs) What is it you were saying, Vance? Well, first of all, I want to talk to Mr. Eckner. You are deaf, Mr. Eckner. Why didn't Miss Jarness know that? And did Mr. Simmons know it? No one here knew it. I can read lips perfectly... I was afraid to tell Mr. Simmons I was deaf. I thought maybe he wouldn't give me the job when I applied for it, and, well, I needed it. I see. Well, I imagine that's reasonable. Apparently, you were the only one here last night when the murder was committed. I know you can't hear, so I don't expect you to be able to give me much information, but can you tell me anything at all? I think so, Mr. Vance. Well, go ahead, man. We're waiting. Well, I was awake all last night, gentlemen. In my room, there's a lamp connected with the same electric eye device that sets off the gongs. Nobody could get near this house without my going out to investigate. And nobody did. Hello. Hello, is that you, Jim? Betty, honey, how's my favorite sister? I've been trying for 15 minutes to get you on the phone, Jim. How soon can you get here? Uh, What do you mean? Jim, Mr. Simmons has been murdered. And Philo Vance thinks I did it. You've got to get here right away. Yeah, okay, sis. I'll hop on a train in a half hour, but it'll take time. Fifteen or sixteen hours, maybe longer, if I don't get a fast train. Fly in, Jim, please. Betty, you know I can't fly. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. I forgot for a second. Of course you can't fly. We'll take the train, but hurry. I need somebody on my side, Jim. It's got to be you. Don't worry, honey. They aren't going to kick my kid sister around. I'll be there first thing in the morning. Where are you now? I'm at the Simmons house calling from the hall. Oh, hurry, Jim, please hurry. Hang on tight, kid. I'll be there. Bye. Goodbye. Why couldn't you fly, Miss Jarnis? Oh. I didn't mean to startle you, and I certainly didn't mean to eavesdrop. But apparently I've done both, so I might as well take advantage of this situation. Why can't your brother fly here? He cracked up flying a plane about five years ago. He won't go into a plane. But what excuse does that give you to listen to my conversation? Miss Jarnis, believe me. I have no excuse. But I do have a reason. There's a man out here to see you, Mr. Rodney. He told me to tell you his name was Buck. Buck, eh? Send him in, Miss Morgan. Send him right in. Come in, Buck. Sit down. Thanks, Mr. Rodney. Don't mind if I do. Cigar? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's right, Buck. Sit down. You did a good job. I'm proud of you. Simmons is dead, ain't he? You sent me to see that he got dead, didn't you? I saw to it. Yep, you certainly did. And here's the money you asked for, just the way you asked for it in small bills. Anybody see you come in here? Nope. And nobody's going to see me leave. And nobody's going to see me again in this town for two years. I'm blowing this bug just like our deal said I should. Yeah, you're a fine man for a delicate job, Buck. I don't know how you did it, and I don't care. Okay, boss. And now I got my dough, and you got your corpse. And so I'm blowing out of here to this back door. You know, Rodney, I kind of enjoy knocking off a guy. Makes me feel like I was put into this world for a reason. So long. Yes, Mr. Rodney? Miss Morgan, call police headquarters for me, will you? Police headquarters? I want to report that if the police are looking for the murderer of Ezra Simmons, they can pick up Buck Digby at the Crosstown Station in an hour. Hi, Markham. Ah, there you are, Vance. Glad you got here. Where have you been? Doing a little investigating, Markham. I knew I could leave you here at the Simmons Mansion with complete confidence that if anything turned up, you'd let me know about it. Something has turned up, Vance. Two things, in fact. One of them is that Miss Jarness' brother has arrived from out of town this morning. What's the other? How did you know? Oh, you'll have a reasonable way, I know, so let's (laughs) skip that. 
The other thing that turned up is that we picked up Mr. Simmons' murderer. I beg your pardon. We got a tip that Buck Digby killed Simmons and was about to leave town. We caught him at the station, and of course he denied everything, but we're pretty sure it's he. Are you, Markham? Yes. Has he told you how he succeeded in getting into this house despite the wall, the electric eye, and the barred windows? Well, no, he hasn't. He probably won't either, Markham, because the chances are he didn't kill Simmons despite your tip. I think I know who murdered Ezra Simmons, Markham. And believe me, it isn't Buck Digby. You haven't told me what I should do, Jim. You just sit there. I'm thinking, sis. I'm thinking. You know, I don't think so good after 15 hours in a sleeper. Now, off the record... You didn't kill Simmons? Oh, for on the record, I didn't kill him. A million dollars is a big reason, sis. There you go again. Sorry, I was just trying to make... Who's there? Philo Vance, may I come in? Come in. Please forgive my intruding into your room, Miss Jarnes, but I was anxious to meet your brother. How do you do, sir? I'm Philo Vance. Hi. What's going on here, Vance? What are they trying to do, frame my sister for that old buzzard's murder? No. Nobody's trying to frame her, Mr. Jarnes. If she's innocent, I assure you, she won't be put in jail. Until we're sure, we're keeping her in this house. Miss Jarnes, is there a room in this house that is relatively soundproof? The basement is. It's equipped with all the gongs and stuff. But you can't hear what's going on in the rest of the house, if that's what you mean. That's what I mean. I'm going to ask you and your brother to go down there. Join Mr. Markham and Harold Eckner. You're all going to see me drive down the road and out through the gate. And when you see me again, I'll be in this house without an alarm being sounded or a window bar being out. I'll get in just like the murderer got in. Vance has been gone over an hour. I can't understand what's keeping him. I can, Mr. Markham. He just couldn't get in here without sounding those bells. How could anybody? Nobody could, Jim. I went over the plans with the company that installed the electric eye. It's impossible for anybody to get into this place without sounding the alarm. You're trying to make it look awfully bad for me, Miss Jarnes. I was the only one in the house when Mr. Simmons was killed. If it looks bad for you, that's not my fault. I didn't kill Mr. Simmons. What I'd like to know is who did. Is that all you'd like to know, Markham? Vance! I can tell you who did. Vance, you did it. You got in. Not that there was any doubt in my mind that you would. Thank you, my friend. And I believe when I arrived just now, I said I could tell you who killed Mr. Simmons. I can. Markham, you can arrest Miss Jarnes' brother for murder. Now, this requires a lot of explanation, Vance. Let's start with Buck Digby. All right. He went to kill Simmons, but he found he couldn't get in the mansion without setting off all those guns, so he gave up the idea. Then he heard on the radio that Simmons was dead, so he figured he'd collect regardless. And the man who sent him to kill Simmons, that Mr. Rodney, he tipped us off to Buck. Why would he do that? Two reasons. He was an allegedly respectable citizen. He knew that Buck would involve him if he were arrested, but he could always deny the accusation. However, if Buck remained at liberty... Rodney would be blackmailed by him for the rest of his life, and he knew it. I see. Now tell me this. Jim Jarnas was in South City, a thousand miles from here, on the afternoon of Simmons' death. He was afraid to fly, yet you claim he was in this house at midnight in time to kill Simmons. That's right. He was afraid to fly, Markham, but he flew just the same. But he couldn't have flown a plane over the wall and landed on those rocks outside. Nothing could land on them safely. Yes, I know, Markham. But Jim flew in from South City in about four or five hours. And then he rented a helicopter from a flying field about ten miles down the road. How do you know that? I rented one there myself a little while ago. Those helicopters are wonderful. They can land on anything, including the roof of the Simmons house, which is where I landed. You know how flat the roof is. Yes. So that's how you got into the house without the alarms going off. That's right. I landed on the roof, opened the skylight, and came down as nice as you please. Oh, Vance. The man at the flying field described the man who had rented a helicopter the night of the murder... And so I knew who our murderer was. Well, I'll be darned. What about a motive, Vance? Well, Markham, wouldn't you like to have a sister, your only living relative, who had a million dollars? (laughs) Yes, yes, I would. (laughs) One more thing, Vance. 
Everything logical pointed to the fact that this was an inside job, that Simmons was killed by either Miss Jarnas or the caretaker. Why were you so sure it wasn't? Because, Markham, we know Miss Jarnas wasn't at the mansion the night of the murder. But the caretaker didn't know that. She probably called up to him that she was leaving, but don't forget, he couldn't hear. Oh, I understand now. He'd never have tried to murder Simmons thinking Miss Jarnas was in the house, and he never knew she'd left. Right. That the end of your questions, my friend? The end of my questions, Vance, and the end of the million-dollar murder case. (laughs) 